I never forget our first meeting in Roswell, New Mexico. We had our first team meeting with our whole squad. We had a hundred and some people there. And I told them, the first thing I told that, that team, I said, listen, I don't know how long this league is going to last. I don't know what will happen. But when the end comes, I want to make sure that we are going to wind up being the winningest team in the history of the American Football League. The Dallas Texans were born with the American Football League in 1960. They won their first championship in 1962. Then the Texans left Dallas and became the Kansas City Chiefs. By 1970, Hank Stram had led the Chiefs to two more AFL titles and a victory in Super Bowl IV. Yeah, that's it, baby. And the Chiefs went into the record books as the winningest team in the 10-year history of the AFL. The Chiefs and the American Football League were both founded by a quiet man who dreamed of bringing pro football to his hometown. When Lamar Hunt was still in his 20s, he tried unsuccessfully to acquire an NFL team for Dallas. The enormous popularity of college football and the Cotton Bowl convinced him that Dallas was ready for the NFL. But the NFL was not ready to expand. So Hunt decided to form a new league, and the AFL was born. We probably thought it would be a lot easier than it was, but uh, time proved out that there was a market for uh, another league and another set of cities. There were a lot of cities like Dallas, and Houston, and Denver, that were starved for a sports team, for a football team. When the NFL learned about Hunt's plans, they changed their minds and decided to expand after all. They cut a deal with millionaire businessman Clint Murkison and put an expansion team, the Cowboys, in Dallas. It was the first shot fired in a bitter six-year war between the leagues. Instead of having the Cotton Bowl to himself, Hunt had to share it with the Cowboys. He tried to hire Tom Landry as head coach, and he picked Don Meredith in the first AFL draft. Both signed with the Cowboys. Still, the early Cowboys were a hapless lot compared to the early Texans. From a dream to reality in just one year, the Dallas Texans of the American Football League. When the Texans were at home, the Cowboys were playing on television, and neither team did well at the box office. But the Texans assembled a talented roster by mining small colleges and native talent. They had one of the AFL's first stars in running back Abner Haynes, who won the rushing title in 1960. Pittsburgh drafted me in the NFL. But Mr. Hunt called and said, don't do nothing. You know, you could negotiate with them. In the NFL, I had friends that didn't even had never seen them. But in the AFL, you were a part of it. You know, you were with the organization. In addition to Haynes, true Texans on the Texans roster included quarterback Cotton Davidson, fullback Jack Spikes, defensive lineman Jerry Mays, and linebackers E.J. Holub and Cheryl Hedrick. Chris Burford was an All-American wide receiver from Stanford. He signed with the Texans in their first year and quickly established himself as a big play counterpart to Abner Haynes. From coast to coast, from September to December, the American Football League race was a hectic and exciting one. We feel like December 1961 will find the American Football League championship resting in the hands of the Dallas Texans. Hank Stram was a little-known college assistant when he was hired in lieu of Tom Landry. But he proved to be an ideal leader for the fledgling team. He excelled at teaching fundamentals and developing young talent. Stram would hold the job for 15 years. I, I never thought about it. I never thought I'd get fired. <laughs> I never thought about that at all. The only time I really, uh, I was a little, little concerned Second year I was with uh, the Dallas Texans. We went through a phase where we started off great and then we went through a stage where we lost about three or four games by a point. With the team in a slump, Stram began to wonder if Lamar Hunt still had confidence in him. 
I thought about a million things that, you know, was, was it the quarterback or was it the way we were playing or, and all of a sudden when I got downtown, the last thought I had was, gee, maybe, maybe he's calling in to, to play the traveling music. You know, maybe school is out, maybe he's going to fire me. But if Hunt had any misgivings about his coach, they were laid to rest by Stram's most important acquisition of 1962. In 1962, Stram brought in quarterback Len Dawson, whom he had coached at Purdue. But Dawson had languished for five years in the NFL, and even Lamar Hunt was skeptical. Lamar Hunt, uh, I think he tried to cut me the first week that he saw me in training camp. That's, at least that's the story I got. We used to have a lot of fun prior to every season. Lamar Hunt, Bunker Hunt, and uh, some of his friends would always make a list of players who they thought would make our team. And so none of the four people, Bunker, Lamar, none of those pals of his, not one of them had him making our football team when the season started. I didn't know that the whole family was against me. I thought it was just, just Lamar. But uh, now I know the entire family was going thumbs down on Len Dawson. But, you know, I could understand why they said that, too, because my, my skills were, had eroded. Lamar Hunt, you know, he wasn't out there uh, telling me, you know, how's my hands under the center and all that. No, but he provided the opportunity for me to get together with a guy like Hank Stram that could take the skills that I once had when I was at Purdue University, where he was an assistant football coach, and bring them back and polish those skills to where I could compete in the, at the professional level and be successful at the professional level. Dawson won the starting position and led the Chiefs to an 11-3 record, throwing for 29 touchdowns and completing 61% of his passes. He was nimble enough to be effective in Hank Stram's moving pocket and was always a threat to run. At midseason, the Texans scored an upset win over two-time defending champion Houston Oilers, and the 62 championship became a battle for Texas bragging rights. When you grow up in Texas, in Dallas, or Houston, you grow up with the rivalry. In high school, I learned to compete and have disdain for Houston. And I love to play the Houston Oilers because they were already champions. And we thought we were good enough, but we had not won. The 62 title game brought together Lamar Hunt and Bud Adams, whose early alliance made the Dallas-Houston rivalry the starting point of the AFL. In game planning for the Oilers, Hank Stram had to deal with the loss of wide receiver Chris Burford who had injured his knee in the regular season. With Burford on the sidelines, Stram deployed his remaining weapons in novel formations. We come up with the elephant backfield, which meant we were going to play two fullbacks. Because don't forget, I'm at wide receiver. Curtis McClinton and Jack Spikes back there running the ball, and we were coming to hit you. We didn't want with three or four yards. We just wanted to punish you. Heck, I thought we'd beat them 40 to nothing the way it started. The versatile Haynes scored two touchdowns in the second quarter, giving the Texans a 17-0 lead at the half. Going to Haynes, he's down to the 20, he's under the 5, and he's over. Haynes scores! Edna Haynes, a remarkable performer who can hurt you from any place on the field in many ways. But the Oilers did all the scoring in the second half and forced the game into overtime. Touchdown and a point to tie this game up. The first and strangest sudden death overtime in AFL history began with Abner Haynes' famous gaffe. You have your choice, of course, receiving or kicking. We will kick to the clock. You're gonna kick? Yes. To the clock. Right. Come back to the sideline and Hank is, is a he says, Abner, Abner, what's the deal? What's the deal? He never said to me, you made the wrong call or you messed up. Trusting his defense but fearing the wind, Stram had elected to kick. But Haynes had given both the ball and the wind to the Oilers. In the end, the mix-up didn't matter. 
Late in the fifth quarter, defensive end Bill Hall grabbed the Texans' fifth interception of the day. As the sixth quarter began, Dallas had the ball and the wind. Getting outside at the 35 to the 30, 25, 20, and Mike from Dallas now in real scoring position. Dawson will hold to the 24. The big rush is on, the kick is up, the kick is good. Dallas is the champion. Dallas wins it on a 24-yard field goal by Tommy Booker. They had to go into the second overtime for to win it. The marathon game attracted a huge TV audience and elevated the AFL to a new level of national recognition. I know people who never watched American Football League games because they're always watching the NFL finally saw that, that game and said, hey, this is kind of exciting. I like it. Hank, congratulations. Thank you very much, Jack. It's a great thrill, and I, I just can't compliment this squad enough to, to see the way they came back. They stayed in the ball game in the second half like they did and finally came back and won it. It was a great tribute, I think, to our squad. And uh, we're just as proud as can we that we can win the championship and bring it back to Dallas, Texas. With the 62 championship, the Texans had gained a very big fan in Kansas City. The day after the championship, Mayor Robartle of Kansas City called Lamar and uh, just out of the blue. and said, you know, I'd, young man, I'd like to meet with you about uh, the possibility of moving your team to Kansas City. He had watched the game on television. As a result of that, we ended up in Kansas City. I know that Lamar didn't want to leave Dallas, and that shows you the type of individual he is, because he could have stayed in Dallas. I mean, he had enough money to stay there and compete against the Cowboys, but he was more concerned about the American Football League in itself. And at that particular stage in 1962, something had to happen. Kansas City's municipal stadium would have to be converted from baseball to football. So Lamar Hunt and Jack Stedman went unannounced to check out the field. We're out there and we're walking, walking on the field, you know, and looking well. We can put bleachers here and we can do this there and so forth here. And, and you know, Usually nobody's on the field. So I got down the ladder, went out there, and said, I'm sorry, sir, you can't be on this field. This is off limits. George Toma just starts yelling at us. Get off my field, get off my field. A month later, the Dallas Texans come to Kansas City. So I throw the owner of the uh, Texans off the field and the Chiefs. So he said, well, if he's that tough, I want him to work for me. That was our, our first meeting with George Toma. Uh, subsequent to that, Boy, he became a great part of our operation for a lot of years. We were the ones that started painting the field. In Kansas City, Lamar Hunt's flair for color and pageantry created the Chiefs game day experience. A blend of high school pep rally, Busby Berkeley Review, Wild West Show, and Lawrence Welk. We had the Tony DePardo who was in charge of music. I would be in the huddle and he would sound this charge, you know, da -da 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 -da, charge! And he'd do it while I was trying to call a play in the huddle. So I had to go to Hank Stram and say, Hank, would you go down to Tony and tell him to do that charge, but when John Hadle with the San Diego Chargers is trying to call a play, not me. Be quiet when I'm in the huddle. The other team's in the huddle, hey, make all the noise you want. When the Chiefs arrived in Kansas City, media coverage was hard to come by until the starting quarterback started moonlighting as a sportscaster. Number 16 would practice until 5.30, then appear on the evening news at 6 and 10. And uh, defensively, as far as the Chiefs are concerned, we have some new faces out there that we have to take a look at. There are only three television stations. The Chiefs wanted one of their guys on that one of those stations so that they weren't getting bad mouth and hopefully to sell some tickets. And so mine was always on the fence. I'm going to badmouth the offensive line? I don't think so. <laughs> because they could say, Lenny, let's see what you can do with no blocking out there. It was a lot of fun, and the players got into it. Because they'd get on camera, and they knew that uh, it was going to be a fun type of thing, and not all that serious. By the time Len Dawson began his career in broadcasting, there was talk that declining ticket sales might force the team to move again. As you can see, these three years we dropped in so what happened was, and to me, today it still amazes me, that they got a lot of the leaders, business leaders in the Kansas City area, and they developed what they called the Red Coat Club. 
and that is businessmen were going out and selling season tickets. And if you sold so many season tickets, you get this red jacket, and uh, you would be part of the Red Coat Club, and you'd be part of the the lineup when the guys were introduced uh, before the game. And it caught on. And the timing was great because I think that was started in about 1965. Then lo and behold, the next year was 1966, and the Chiefs were involved in that first Super Bowl game. And so the city had a lot to do with the success of the Kansas City Chiefs by getting behind him and supporting the football team and making sure that there were some crowds out there every Sunday when the Chiefs played. By 1966, the Chiefs had connected with Kansas City and were building the kind of regional appeal that Lamar Hunt had envisioned for AFL teams in smaller markets. Our team in Kansas City, we aren't really just Kansas City's team, we're the, we call our team Mid-America's team. We represent Kansas, Missouri, the western half of Missouri, Oklahoma, Arkansas, Iowa, and Nebraska. Key acquisitions of the early Kansas City years laid the foundation for the great Chiefs teams of 1966 through 71. Defensive tackle Buck Buchanan, the first overall pick in the 63 draft, established the prototype for future pro defensive linemen. Big, fast, and agile. Wide receiver Otis Taylor, famously snatched away from NFL babysitters in 1965, was a mainstay of the offense for 10 years and made some of the biggest plays in franchise history. Running back Mack Lee Hill made the Chiefs roster in 1964 as a rookie free agent. He had such an intensity and wanted to succeed. And I could still see him, I could visualize him getting tackled and bumping and trying to fight and scratch for an extra yard or two. And that was his attitude, just to get as much as he possibly could. And uh, worked his way not only to make the team, but was the starting running back, fullback with the Kansas City Chiefs. And the future looked very bright for him. Mackley Hill died tragically during surgery after suffering a knee injury late in the 65 season. Only his second in the league. His passing had a lasting effect on the team. Speaking at a memorial service after Mack's sudden death, team captain Len Dawson eulogized. Mack the truck, that man with a giant heart and quiet way has left us. His years were not many in number, but he accomplished that for which we all strive complete respect and admiration. This is how we will remember him, a man of great strength and determination, unbounded loyalty and devotion. Nineteen sixty-six was the year when the AFL and NFL declared a truce and agreed to merge. In November, NFL Commissioner Pete Rozelle came to Kansas City to meet with Lamar Hunt about plans for the merger and the first AFL-NFL championship game, which Hunt had dubbed the Super Bowl. Down on the field, the Chiefs ran their record to 7-2 against the Chargers, on their way to a Western Division title. Above the grandstand at Municipal Stadium were signs representing the AFL teams, reminders of Hunt's tenacious commitment to the survival of every team in the merger negotiations. While the Chiefs owner focused on the merger, his head coach was winning games. Hunt showed his appreciation at a send-off dinner before the AFL championship game in Buffalo. January 1st, I think all will agree, is the to be the most important day in Kansas City sports history and to make sure that Hank can see the future clearly. As of that date, we're tearing up his contract and awarding him a new five-year contract as coach of the Kansas City Chiefs. On a frigid New Year's Day in ancient War Memorial Stadium, the defending champion Buffalo Bills were trying for a three-peat. But the Chiefs jumped out to an early lead and cruised to a 31-7 victory. Rookie Mike Garrett, who was recruited to fill the void left by the death of Mac Lee Hill, applied the coup de grace with a spectacular touchdown run. I 
With their Super Bowl opponent yet to be determined and two weeks to prepare, the AFL champions celebrated at the hotel that night. I think it was a mistake. I made a mistake. Before the game, I told the team, I said, now, I'm not saying if we win the game. I'm saying after we win the game today, we're going to come back to the hotel, watch the Dallas Green Bay game to determine who we're going to play in the Super Bowl game. We're going to go home, change clothes, and go right out to Los Angeles and get ready for the Super Bowl. We're going to be out there for two weeks. Boy, that would be great. But I didn't realize that it wouldn't be great because two weeks is too much time away from your home environment. Always a believer in rigorous preparation and anxious to make a good showing against the legendary Vince Lombardi, Stram pushed his team hard. The practices were very heated practices and we worked long. I do think we practiced too long. I think uh, it was an all new experience for all of us and uh, I think we left some of our legs on the practice field. I personally thought that uh, a lot of our players were in awe of the Green Bay Packers. Before the game, we were saying, well, if we play well, if we don't make mistakes, if the Green Bay doesn't play exceptionally well, we got a good chance maybe to beat these guys. That was our approach. You know, that is not a positive approach. The L.A. Coliseum was less than two-thirds full. And although thousands of impassioned Kansas City fans were there to support the Chiefs, the AFL champions knew that they were playing for more than hometown pride. We weren't playing just for Kansas City. We were playing for every team in the American Football League. And so there was a tremendous amount of pressure on us to do well in that football game. And we felt it. I know I felt it. In the first half, the underdog Chiefs had enough success on both sides of the ball to relieve their pre-game jitters. Dawson back to pass with plenty of time. Loops one long for Taylor, who is clear. He's going to the seven-yard line of his right down there. Dawson calling signals on first down. Keeps to the ball. Rolls out to the right. He's got a man clear. We were very successful moving the ball against that defense. I really felt, and a lot of our teammates really felt, that we're going to win this football game. Trailing 14-10, the Chiefs began the second half with renewed confidence. But on their first possession, Len Dawson made a crucial mistake. Dawson being rushed and thrown. And down the sidelines comes Willie Wood. Only one man can get him at the 10. And right we were moving again when I threw that interception. And I think looking back at the films, it's something they had the blitz on and they were able to get to me. Uh, what I would love to do is have that ball back again to eat it or just throw it up in the seat someplace because that was the turning point. The Packers scored 21 unanswered points for a 35 to 10 victory. But for the Chiefs, the loss itself hurt less than Vince Lombardi's post-game comments. I think the Kansas City team is a real top football team. It doesn't compare with the National Football League team. That's what you want me to say, I said it. <laughs> well, that irritated us. And that, that, that stuck with us until we had another opportunity to get back to a Super Bowl. We know that that was a motivating factor for us to get a little better so that we can compete against the best. The Chiefs rode into 1967 on a tidal wave of emotion and fan support. In the preseason, the Chicago Bears became the first NFL team ever to play at Municipal Stadium. They soon found out just how eager the Chiefs were to erase the stigma of Super Bowl I. Everybody was so emotional, talking about the upcoming game, and it was an exhibition game against the Chicago Bears. So there was some very, very deep feelings. Setting aside the usual preseason niceties, the Chiefs bombed away at the Bears for the full 60 minutes. I was on the kickoff team, and I remember it very well because I went down on 11 kickoffs because we, uh, we wound up winning that game by 66 to 24, something like that. 
In the offseason, Hank Stram had focused on the weaknesses exposed by the Packers in the Super Bowl. He spent two second round draft choices in hopes of improving at middle linebacker. Willie Lanier, out of Little Morgan State, would compete for the position with Notre Dame's Jim Lynch. Well, I think any time you have a competition like the, the kind that Jim can provide, that we, either one of us who wins a position for the middle linebacker job, we would be able to represent the team as uh, the Chiefs would like to be represented. It never really occurred to me that there had never been a black middle linebacker before. Obviously, Willie Lanier wanted to be the first black middle linebacker in the NFL, and he deserved the position, no question. He was a very, very good football player, which obviously has proven out that he's in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. With Lanier in the middle, Stram moved Lynch to the outside, and both men became part of the best linebacking core in pro football. In the handling of talent, Hank Stram had a big advantage over many of his contemporaries. He was unhampered by racial prejudice. In 1969, he started eight African Americans on defense a lineup without precedent in pro football. We don't particularly care what color he is, what nationality, what anything. The only concern we have is uh, bringing them in with the idea of competing for our squad, and if they earned a right to be a member of our 40-man squad, then they're going to be here. Stram's attitude applied off the playing field as well, with Lamar Hunt's backing. Initially, when we located in Kansas City, our training camp was about 20 minutes north of downtown Kansas City, and uh, some of the players that were black went into the drugstore or something, they wouldn't serve them. Well, we were ready to move. Lamar and Hank says, that, hey, let's get an understanding here, or we're not going to be here. So that was the attitude of both Lamar Hunt and Hank Stram at the time. Hank Stram was a complete coach, a leader of men and a master of X's and O's, who was always working out new wrinkles to add another dimension to the game. All right, this is our playbook, and it's divided into three chapters. From the unique open huddle to dizzying pre-snap choreography, Stram's innovative schemes were designed to confuse and frustrate his opponents. Stram's basic strategy was if you can get a football player on the football field and have him not know for sure what he's supposed to be doing then you have a very big advantage I think that was the basis of his coaching but while Stram was striving to get back to the Super Bowl the rest of the AFL was improving as well and no team more than Kansas City's nemesis the Oakland Raiders. Oakland was the arch enemy. We were in the same division and we were the two best teams we felt in the league. It was a rivalry that I was introduced to when I first came with the Chiefs. You get indoctrinated right away, you get brainwashed right away, and uh, uh, I can't root for the Raiders today. <laughs> There was a stretch where the Kansas City Chiefs played the Oakland Raiders and it lost seven out of eight games, which was bitter, bitter frustration. In 1968, the Chiefs went 12 and two, only to be eliminated in a divisional playoff by the Raiders. In 68, to lose that game as we did, it really inspired us that we had to really improve our game overall. That when we got back again, to that kind of situation against Oakland, we would not have that same occurrence. So it was one of really giving impetus to the 1969 season. On opening day in 1969, Len Dawson led the Chiefs to victory in San Diego, despite playing with a bruised hand. But a week later, he suffered a far more serious injury in a 31-0 win at Boston. Sensing that the team had a real chance to return to the Super Bowl, Dawson made a risky decision to forego surgery and try to return to action that season. When Dawson's veteran backup, Jackie Lee, broke his ankle in his first start, 
the Chiefs were forced to turn to second-year quarterback Mike Livingston. Mike, is it particularly difficult for you mentally to get ready for this ball game in your situation? Well, it's, it's not too difficult uh, mentally. It's a tremendous challenge, and uh, it's a great opportunity for me, and uh, I just hope I can make the best of it. I remember Hank Stram at that time saying, look, it doesn't make any difference who the quarterback is. It's just like driving a Cadillac. It's still a Cadillac. You get in there, you're going to have somebody drive it, and everything's going to work out all right. And you know what? We believe that. With Mike Livingston being the starting quarterback, the third string starting quarterback, he won five straight football games. Livingston didn't have to do it all by himself. Stram's Cadillac offense performed as advertised. And he's still running out. He's looking back. The reality was that we had to go week to week and continue to win because you couldn't lose a few games and maybe find yourself out of contention. So we had to do a lot more to give the whole team a chance to succeed. Dawson returned to action in week nine, but in the weeks to come, he faced one adversity after another. The death of his father, poor performance in a loss to the Raiders, and re-injury of his knee. When the Chiefs traveled to Oakland in week 14, both teams were in the playoffs, but home field advantage was up for grabs. Surprisingly, Stram ran the ball on almost every play, practically giving the win to Oakland. Having Len Dawson healthy for the playoffs was more important than playing at home. The Kansas City Chiefs had already been to the Super Bowl. They didn't want to get to the Super Bowl, they wanted to win the Super Bowl. So now we're in a situation where we've got to take the hardest road we can possibly get to winning the Super Bowl. Against the defending champion Jets in New York, the Chiefs were clinging to a 6-3 lead in the fourth quarter when a pass interference call gave Joe Namath the ball on the one-yard line. So as I'm heading down the field to call the defense, I'm noticing heads are starting to be bowed, concessions are starting to be accepted, that they felt we were going to lose. And my reality was that that was not a concession we could make. What ensued was the greatest goal line stand in Chiefs history. by Glenear and Gary May. Running play coming off the map is stop to the goal line. Glenear hits him. And again, the Jets did not make it. It's third down and one. On third down, Namath tried to play action, but Bobby Bell read the play perfectly. What pressure put on by Bobby Bell? Bobby Bell made the Jets quarterback commit himself. While the defense was holding the Jets to a tying field goal, Otis Taylor was drawing in the dirt. Taylor's sandlot sketch turned into the biggest offensive play of the game. On the next play, Dawson hit Gloucester Richardson for the winning touchdown. Lenny takes the snap, he fakes the run, but he'll be back to throw. He goes one deep for Richardson, touchdown! We knew this was just the one game we had to win to get to where we wanted to go, and that is to Oakland, California, and play the Oakland Raiders. And we knew that was not going to be easy. They'd beaten us twice already in that season. to throw the Monica, he is sacked. Did he get free by Aaron Brown? The defense racked up four sacks and four interceptions. After three years of Raider dominance, this day belonged to the Chiefs. Lenny Dawson gives on a running play to Bobby Holmes. He turns the corner, he scores! And when we played the Oakland Raiders in the final game between two American Football League teams and won that game to get us to the Super Bowl, it was a milestone. How many people, I wonder, really thought the American Football League would succeed? In just one week, the Chiefs would get their second chance at Super Bowl glory. But the football experts still looked down on the AFL and favored the invincible Vikings by 13 points. We were not ready for prime time players. We resented that. 
So that was a motivating factor to us because we didn't know too much about the Minnesota Vikings. And uh, fortunately, they didn't know too much about us. We've got a myriad of formations. We've got formations that you start out in one thing, you're completely different before the ball snap. You'll go through three separate formations in one series. And if you're not watching that every day, it gets extremely confusing. And they've got one week to figure out the tendencies of the Kansas City Chiefs, which is a virtual impossibility. Hank Stram exploited the Vikings' confusion with the most famous play call in Chiefs history. Blaster, tell him 65 toss power trap. Get in there for 65 toss power trap. 65 toss power trap. That might pop wide open, Rats. Running play coming to Garrett on a trap. Touchdown! Garrett scores two. <laughs> yeah! The mentor. 65 toss power trap. Yeah! <laughs> yeah! I told you that made me the chair. Yes, sir, boys. <laughs> Woo! Put your hand over your heart and you can feel it pound out. What a moment for all of the Kansas City Chiefs. They're beating the best that the NFL has to offer out here today. In the last game of the AFL era, it was Otis Taylor who sealed the win. What we did was, I went on a quick count. They had an all-out blitz coming, which they generally didn't. They blitzed very seldom. I hit Otis Taylor with a little hitch pass. That was the only pass I could have gotten rid of. Lenny Dawson, listen to the crowd. Nice going, Leonard. Len Dawson was the game's MVP, the ultimate vindication for a player who had left the NFL looking for a second chance. The greatest day in the history of Kansas City. This team is the greatest in the universe. As reigning Super Bowl champions, the Chiefs were the toast of Kansas City. And the film of Hank Stram wired for sound had made him a celebrity. How in the world can all six of you miss a play like that? All six of you miss a play. Come on, Lenny. Pump it in there, baby. Just keep matriculating the ball down the field, boys. Where he comes up with these things, I don't know. But uh, he's a classic. <laughs> Stram's wire is priceless but it proved costly for the defending champs. When we opened the season, now it's the merger taking place. Who did we open up against? Minnesota in Minnesota. And I understand that they had asked Bud Grant to be Mike for that Super Bowl IV game. Bud Grant was not the type to wear a wire, but on opening day in 1970, he made sure his players saw the famous film of Kansas City's coach. And he showed it to him once, maybe even twice. They didn't know where Mike was. Didn't know where he was. It was funny to us, but to the Minnesota Viking, I could see it was not too humorous to them. They look like they're flat as hell. And I'll tell you this, when they came out on the field, I don't think their feet hit the ground. These guys were so fired up after watching that film. And I'll tell you what, they kicked our butts in the opening game of that 1970 season. Week two was a coming out party for second year return man and running back Ed Podolak, who would be the Chiefs' biggest offensive weapon of the early 70s. Podolak had his first 100-yard game against Oakland in week seven, but that contest took an ugly turn late in the fourth quarter, after the Chiefs took a 17-14 lead. We were going to cement the game. Near, uh, near the end of the game, we were going for, going for a touchdown. Lenny's running for a big gain. He gets hit, Ben Davidson. Uh, it was a late hit, we thought. And we have a free-for-all. We have a brawl right out there in the field. Lenny, we, I forget how close we were to the goal line, but that would have clinched the game. 
and we were ahead by three points at that time. And that would have given us seven. We were, we were going to be up by ten, and we'd have easily won the game. There wasn't much time left in the game. Bob Finley was the official in the game. And so Finley made the decision that it was a continuation foul and uh, brought the ball back. Raiders finally got the ball back, and I think the last play of the game, Blanda kicks a 50-yard field goal to tie the game. The tie kept Kansas City out of the playoffs. So that was a very, very dramatic situation, and a game that we really thought we should have won, that we didn't win. But I think that's, you know, that's how, how delicate that series was. A couple of things here and there would make all the difference in the world. 1971 was the last season for Kansas City's Municipal Stadium. And after the disappointment of 1970, the Chiefs were determined to make it a season of triumph. Arguably the best team Hank Stram ever fielded, the 71 Chiefs rolled to a 10-3-1 record and the Western Division title. On Christmas Day, they hosted the only postseason game ever held in Municipal Stadium, a divisional playoff against Don Shula and the Miami Dolphins. The Chiefs entered the game with high hopes of returning to the Super Bowl. Determined to make it happen, Ed Podolak turned in one of the greatest individual efforts in NFL postseason history. He did it all. He did it with pass receiving. He ran for a screen for a touchdown. He ran a kickoff back. He ran punts back. He caught passes. He ran from scrimmage. I don't know whoever played the game at that same position had a greater day than Eddie Podolak did in that Christmas Day game. In all, Podolak racked up 350 all-purpose yards and scored two touchdowns. I imagine Ed felt like he was the only guy out there that day, you know, but uh, whatever it took, he said, just let me have the ball. And, and Lenny was trying to give him the ball every, every play, you know, and he was, he was the guy that was, uh, they couldn't stop him. They just couldn't stop Ed Podolak. Despite Podolak's heroics, Bob Greasy kept Miami in the game and tied it with a touchdown pass late in the fourth quarter. Podolak struck again on the ensuing kickoff. Your premier will kick off. McVay and Podolak are deep. Here is the kick. He gets the high. Back right on the goal line. It's Podolak out to the five. The 10, the 15, the 20. The money the He just eventually ran me out of bounds down inside the 20-yard line, which at that time I figured was going to be a victory anyway with a great kicker like Jan Stenerud on our football team. Waiting for the snap from center. Here it is. Set down. The kick is up. It is... It was the darkest moment in kicker Jan Stenerud's Hall of Fame career. Here's the snap, cut down, the kick is up. He's got the distance. It's good! The Dolphins win! The Dolphins! Gero Yapremian's game-winning kick came in the second overtime period. And the Chiefs' most disappointing moment went into the record books as the longest game ever played. The aftermath was difficult, and unfortunately, it ended up being the end of an era. I think about it often, because there's so many ways that we could have won that ball game, but we didn't. The new era began auspiciously in 1972, with team founder Lamar Hunt's induction into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. and the long-awaited opening of Arrowhead Stadium, still one of the NFL's finest venues. But the early years at Arrowhead were lackluster. 1974, the Chiefs' first losing season in more than a decade, 
brought an end to Hank Stram's Hall of Fame career in Kansas City. In January 1975, Lamar Hunt introduced Hank Stram's successor, San Francisco defensive coordinator Paul Wigan. I want to say first as a start that it's not true that our head coach was hired because he knew the depth of rivalry with Oakland and I want you to think about this that because this gentleman has been working for seven years over in Candlestick Park and that's only seven miles of water away from that uh, house of horrors the Oakland Coliseum. Wigan beat the Raiders 42 to 10 the first time he led the Chiefs against them but that was one of the few high points of his tenure. The first golden age of the Kansas City Chiefs had come to an end. It would be 18 years before they won another division title or had another shot at the Super Bowl. By 1988, Kansas City was a shadow of its former self. Five coaches failed to resurrect the franchise after Hank Stram, and the Chiefs' search broadened to a new general manager as well. We were coming off about 15 years of uh, what I'll call lean times in the, the late 70s and uh, most of the 80s. And uh, I think my father recognized that we needed to go in a different direction. And the thought process was to bring in a true football person to he head the team. There was not one person that was satisfied with our performance. And those guys that go out on the field want confidence in the fact that, hey, we got somebody that's going to get the job done. And when you have someone like that, you're going to play that much better. Lamar Hunt hired a shrewd talent evaluator in Carl Peterson, a former executive of the year with the USFL. Peterson's first move in Kansas City was a novel one. He reached out to fans. You can't jump in the first day and say, hey, we're going to have, we are a championship team, a championship organization. We did a lot of research when we came here. We did demographic studies, we did focus groups and they told us a lot about what the community saw in them. What they saw basically was that in the previous 11 years they had five head coaches, five new turnovers, and uh, they were tired of that. They didn't want any BS, if you will. They wanted honesty, reality. We've been here before, you remember? Enter Marty Schottenheimer, who had a fine reputation as a straight shooter with the Cleveland Browns winning over 40 games and three division titles in the previous four seasons. My coaching philosophy is quite simple. The best way to establish a position of excellence in the National Football League is first to expect it. One thing about me is uh, when I take a job, I have a pretty good idea who's in place. It just was one of those situations that uh, when I looked at it, I just felt like Kansas City at that point in time had the opportunity to progress more quickly to the top. Why do you know Schottenheimer and Peterson became a formidable duo during their first months together, snagging All-American linebacker Derek Thomas with their first round draft choice in 1989. Derek Thomas was our first uh, number one draft choice uh, when I came here. Obviously, as we well knew, was a tremendous athlete coming out of the University of Alabama. I think this guy can bring something to our organization that we are lacking. But the meat and gravy of every NFL roster comes in the later rounds. Thomas was the fourth overall pick. Holy Cross product Rob McGovern was the 255th. Stone solid person, a tough SOB, and a good football player. How you doing? Nothing. Good. Congratulations. I'm gonna put on Coach Schottenheimer in a minute. You dream about certain things, but there's a part of you that never allows you to think it's actually gonna happen because you don't want to go that far out on the limb. When you finally realize that that's gonna happen, it's an incredible feeling. Reminded me a lot of a guy that. Uh, I signed as a college free agent a long time ago, ended up with Marty by the name of Bill Cower. Cower and Tony Dungy, who both went on to Super Bowl glory, served as assistants under Schottenheimer and helped implement a winning culture almost immediately. The three years I worked for Marty, the one thing I learned from him was preparation. We didn't always win, but there was never a situation that I could remember that we weren't prepared for. He 
inspired them to work harder, to, to not accept the losing that had been there for, for the many years. So from that point, no matter what blurb was on that radar, whatever storm we were going to enter, this was a focused football team that was not going to be distracted and it was not going to be denied. Schottenheimer's new look Chiefs displayed old school grit, frustrating the likes of Jimmy Johnson and the Dallas Cowboys with superb play selection and sticky defense. All right, look. Our team, man, all three phases of our team today, one play at a time, get after this bunch, we'll get out of here the way we want to get out of here with one in our win column. Let's go. Let's go, baby. Billy, young quarterback, mix your coverages, including your blitz. Mix some zone in there from time to time. Three and out, three and out, let's go. If it's not in, we're going to go 25 lead. Okay. Get down, get your pads down, and make a hold of for us. Kansas City's offense centered around Christian Okoye, one of the most menacing running backs of his time. Tipping the scales at 260 pounds, Okoye battered his way to the league rushing title that season. Well, all he needs is a couple of blocks. Boy, he is too big and too fast to be playing running back in the NFL. Christian! Christian! Keep it up. Keep it up. Refuse to be blocked, whether it's one guy, two guys, refuse to be blocked. And then you'll get it done. Now let's go. Saxon will punt out of the end zone. Rob, they put a rush on and they got it. Block it through the back of the end zone. Rob McGovern blocked the punt. McGovern stuck on the roster. But it was Thomas, the Chiefs' top draft choice, who leapt to stardom against the Seattle Seahawks in season two. After I got the first two on my first two rushes, I had two sacks. And I said that this, this could be a remarkable day. Barry, good job. Coach just kept making the calls and kept putting me in a position to where I could utilize what I do best. You got him up the field once, you got him inside once, didn't you? Good. Keep working on it. Now you ought to get him right. He'll be rocking on you. And I'm thinking to myself, why don't they help this guy out? Because he cannot block. Derek Thomas one-on-one, -on -one. and Derek was a type of player that when you set your game plan offensively, he had to be accounted for. Thomas collected an NFL record seven sacks by the fourth quarter. On the final play, the eighth was in his grasp. Snap to Craig, back to pass. Derek Thomas comes in, and Craig breaks the tackle of Thomas. Craig throws in the end zone. It's caught. Touchdown, Seattle. I don't believe it. Touchdown, Seattle. Unbelievable. If I could go back in time and change one play, it would probably be the eighth sack against Seattle. That was probably the, the easiest attempt of the whole day. I mean, I beat the tackle clean, and I'm coming up on David Craig, and if I could just break down one step slower, the sack is mine, the game is over. I was just over anxious at that point, and, and the kind of overran Craig, and he throws a touchdown pass. So if I could go back to one play, that one play, and that's a game that I look back on that we should have won, that we did. It was quarterback Steve DeBerg who played with no regrets, leading Kansas City to its first playoff berth since 1986, despite a shattered finger. This right here, the end of it was had, had broken, broken off, and so they straightened it out and then put a pin in this way, um, for, you know, for the end of it. And then I had surgery on it, and um, and then I uh, I didn't miss any games. It was just, you know, uh, some people have the ability to block pain out, you know, better than other people. And um, fortunately, I happen to be one of those people. 
had to play with this, uh, this uh, finger splint for some time. He was a, a, a tough, competitive guy who, um, if he'd have had Steve Young's athletic skills, he might be in the Hall of Fame. Schottenheimer was doubly impressed with DeBerg's success rate against the Raiders. After a regular season sweep in 1991, the Chiefs locked in on beating their rivals again in a first round playoff. Shotgun formation for DeBerg. Throws a short pass up the middle, it's caught. At the 50 by Burton, he's on the 40, he's on the 30, he's gone, touchdown! They're on a roll, baby, they're on a roll! I always felt like the Raiders we're going to try to intimidate you. And I always told our football team, we may lose, but they are not going to intimidate us. On Saturday before the Sunday game, he would put the football team through the game mentally. He would go through the game uh, in all phases of the game to where, I mean, you'd be all psyched up and, you, you know, and all the stuff. He'd put you through it, which was a unique talent that he has to be able to visualize that in front of a football team. One play at a time. Roll that boat. Do it our way. Boat's loaded, man. Let's roll. Oh, yeah. The Chiefs' defense did not disappoint in the first postseason game at Arrowhead Stadium forcing six turnovers, while Barry Word's power running set up a timely play-action pass from DeBerg in the second quarter. Back to pass, DeBerg looks into the end zone, arches a pass, he's got a receiver, back pedaling catch by Jones! They say a touchdown, they say he would have come down, but the defensive man knocked him out of the end zone. DeBerg's throw vaulted Kansas City to its first playoff win since Super Bowl IV. In time, a Super Bowl MVP guided them even further. Playoff games in January can be won or lost with a trade in late April. On April 20th, 1993, the Chiefs acquired a living legend in Joe Montana. The only person that really questioned me that I, um, I stood back and thought about for a little bit was my 80-year-old mother who called and said, uh, why are you trading for a 37-year-old quarterback who's coming off of two major surgeries? He put everything on the line when he went to Kansas City on his own volition, really. He could have stayed in San Francisco, been the darling of the city, made millions of dollars, and yet, he took a really tremendous gamble because he could have ended his career on a real down note. Five days later, Kansas City drafted guard Will Shields to protect their new quarterback. And in June, signed future Hall of Fame running back Marcus Allen, who felt misused with the Raiders. Marcus spent a couple of years relatively inactive and it was based upon a judgment that some people felt in the Raider organization that he was finished as a player. Well, it became quite obvious to everybody around here in 1993 and into 94 that Marcus Allen is anything but finished as a player. Any player that you talk to, any great player that feels that they're a great player, wants the ball in their hands. And I felt, um, you know, I, and, and I wanted to win. So I felt it was important that I, yeah, that I, you know, either run the ball or catch the ball. Um, it's only natural. Allen proved to be the all-purpose threat the Chiefs envisioned that season, scoring 15 touchdowns rushing and receiving, and also provided key blocks for Montana, who steered the team to their first division title since 1971. You can't pay for that type of experience or knowledge or success, this guy has the ability to take every single player, whether on the offense or defense, to the next level. Uh, I don't know that I've ever seen players play quite as hard for an individual. We could see that there was something special and different about the team. Based on numbers alone, Montana was an ace. His career completion percentage was over 63%, then the best in the NFL. Still, as the Pittsburgh Steelers discovered, Montana's grace under fire was his greatest asset, after a blocked punt set up first and goal late in a wild card playoff. And Kansas City's got the ball inside the 10, first down and goal to go. What a play! 
Bill Cowher's Steelers held Montana's offense out of the end zone on three tries. Trailing 24 to 17, Joe Cool needed to score to send it to overtime. Paul Hackett, I've got Paul on the headset upstairs, and Paul gives me a plan. I give it to Joe, and he says, that's fine, that's a good play. And Paul says, now I've got another plan. I said to Joe, Paul's got it. He said, look, just give me a play. It doesn't matter. Just give me a play so I can go think about it. And he turned out on that play, he knew what he was doing all the time. Go, oh, Joe. Fourth and goal to go. Not a more important play has been performed by the Chiefs than what is coming up right now. Back to pass, Montana. Cocks his arm. Looks right. No one there. Looks left. Goes in the end zone. Touchdown! Yeah! He's done it! Joe Montana has done it again! The quarterback with the Hollywood name has just placed a line drive pass into the teeth of the Pittsburgh defense. Over 11 minutes passed in the extra period before kicker Nick Lowry atoned for an earlier miss with a 32-yarder to win it. The Chiefs are going! What a game! I can't believe it! Got the cold chills, baby! The Oilers were not intimidated by Montana magic. Buddy Ryan's defense openly predicted the quarterback would not finish the game. Joe Montana? Who's that, man? Oh, that guy's 37 years old, ain't he? Gonna take it to him today. Knockout, baby. He won't last the first quarter. Believe me, I said it first. This is a game of the heart! A barrage of blitzes lashed both Montana and Pro Bowler Warren Moon. But it was Houston that held the 13-7 lead in the fourth quarter. Snap the drop back, sets in the pocket, it crumbles, he's hit. A football on the play, it's loose, and Sonny Moore picks up with a 10. All three of the offseason pickups starred in the game's final 10 minutes. Shields supplied the blocks. Montana went deep. Allen landed the knockout blow. A back pedaling, leaping catch. played with great heart and whatever you do in life whether it's this or anything else if you play with your heart if you work with your heart there's nothing you can't accomplish we had one guy that made a comment his comment was believe 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 and Derek yes we believed the Montana era Chiefs had one last duty to perform in 1994 Coach Schottenheimer was still without a victory in Denver against John Elway. I think John and Marty have a lot of the same character traits. They're both extremely competitive, but somehow, some way, Marty seemed to always come up on the short end of, of that stick. The best performance that I've seen, and I'm sure it had something to do with the fact that, you know, Elway was on the other side, was the Monday night game we had in Denver. Elway once again took him down, found a way to score, but this time, you know, Joe had some time left. Elway was the master of comebacks with over 30 game-saving drives in the fourth quarter. With 89 ticks left and 75 yards ahead, Montana was simply the master. It was a funny thing. I mean, it got to a point where he had so much confidence, he knew he was going to do it. The players that were in the huddle knew that he was going to do it. Then it would get to the point where the players on his team were on the sideline. If you watch them, they knew he was going to do it. Then the fans in the stands knew he was going to do it. And where it becomes the ultimate is when the other team knows he's going to do it. You know, it was a big game for us, a Monday night game, and uh, you know, everyone was really fired up for the game, but I feel like we came out and we were probably a little too fired up. Uh, you know, everyone trying to uh, 
do more than their job, you know, trying to, you know, make make more plays than they're supposed to, and uh, you know, I think it affected us. First and goal to go at the six. Montana takes the snap, back to throw, looking right, firing a pass at a leaping grab. Willie Davis, touchdown, Kansas City. Willie Davis made the catch. Marty's got his first one at mile high. The guy was the third read on the play. I mean, he looked at one and that wasn't there. He looked at another and that one just turned and threw it out there and, uh, and, and Willie caught it to win the game. So uh, he, he was a big play guy. He knew exactly what he was trying to do on the field at all times. Kansas City reached the playoffs both seasons Montana played there. So the team faced new challenges following his retirement. Experts predicted a steep drop-off for the Chiefs and a last-place finish in the AFC West. The people in preseason who make these predictions, you know, most of these guys, they're just what they call analysts. They've never been in the trenches. They've never been to training camp. They never had to practice two a days. All they're doing is reading statistics that the PR department uh, supplies for them, and they go off of that. The only way you can make those people shut up is win. Kansas City stunned riders and opponents alike as it reinvented itself every week. Some Sundays featured Marcus Allen, who scored his 100th rushing touchdown. Others showcased dramatic efforts from the Chiefs' defense and special teams, en route to a 13-3 record. Picked up by Mark Collins, 25-20, Collins 10-5, touchdown Kansas City! The Miracle Chiefs do it again! You know, when Joe came around, you know, Marty's kind of like trying to do that old San Francisco style, but I guess it wasn't really Marty's style. Before, when Joe was here, you know, like, all right, Joe, let's do it. You know, I mean, you know, that's why you're here. But now, it's like there were different players, groups of players that made different things happen. This game's over, and you listen to me closely. It's the first time a team has gone undefeated in its division since the 1985 Chicago Bears. But more importantly, Kansas City has the best record in the National Football League. The best way to be a winner is to stand tall and say very little and let those deeds which you perform speak. At the touchdown banquet, when there were all the doubts, not only around the country, but maybe even the minds of some of the people in our community, we said there is no reason to talk. There's but an opportunity to do. Since you said it all, we're going to keep this brief. We just simply say thank you. 13th three Mark. Thanks, guys. The lack of a downfield threat typically hamstrung the Chiefs in the playoffs, forcing the team to rethink their conservative philosophy. Our emphasis is on trying to make uh, bigger plays instead of just beating people up and trying to uh, maul them down the stretch, but making big plays, uh, more plays down the field, 25 yards and beyond. I think we uh, need to improve in that area. Kansas City did its homework before draft day 1997, spotting instant offense not on the fields of Notre Dame or Florida, but on the hardwood of Cal Berkeley. I remember seeing them sitting on the sideline at the game, and I didn't, I didn't even know they were going to be there. All of a sudden, I look over, I'm like, Dude, that's Marty Sottenheimer, you know? I, th I thought I did okay, but after the game, I had heard that uh, Carl Peterson was uh, saying that, well, at least we know he's coming to the NFL because <laughs> he, he can't make a 15-foot jump shot. We felt confident in watching him play basketball that he was a great athlete, but maybe not a great shooter as a basketball player, that there was no doubt in anybody's mind that he was going to become a great receiving tight end and if you can get a guy like that, uh, they're very rare. The Chiefs moved up five spots in the first round to select Gonzalez. But early on, his potential far exceeded his productivity. After watching the rookie make just eight catches in his first seven games, the veteran Allen offered his support. During the middle of the season, I kind of hit that rookie wall that most rookies go through because the season's so long and we're not used to it and uh, my production was kind of slipping a little bit and he noticed it. And um, I remember he came, up to, he came up to me and said, hey man, give me your phone number, I want to call you. And I didn't know what he wanted to talk about. And so uh, I remember I, you know, I was home that night, he, sure enough he called me that night 
And he just talked to me. He just said, hey, man, I'm seeing a difference in your game. You need to, you need to work for it. It's almost over, you know. Just take a deep breath and, and go out there and, and have that confidence because you can do it. And it, that's, a, that's an amazing power that someone can have. Like, like just, just from simple saying, hey, you know what, you can do it. And, and then you say, you know what, I can do it. From then on, my confidence was, was high just because of a simple phone call. At the close of Gonzalez's first season, the division champion Chiefs faced the Denver Broncos in the second round of the playoffs. There, the tight end's play foreshadowed a career that would see him become Kansas City's all-time leading receiver. Gerback, wanting to throw the football, in trouble, wheeling around, turning right, holding the ball in the right hand, still holds it, now fires it late, and it's on touchdown! Kansas City! Tony Gonzalez, 12-yard pass play. Kansas City takes the lead. And he was as good as any receiver in that area. You're throwing a long pass, throw that thing up there. Because he has a better chance of coming down with it because of his leaping ability and uh, his great hands that he had, his timing. The rookie's other end zone grab was ruled out of bounds, which could have been the margin of victory. The eventual Super Bowl champions prevailed 14 to 10. The Denver Broncos have won this game. The Broncos come from behind to beat Kansas City 14 to 10. Their disappointment and the disappointment of all of us will have to be borne. I had more fun coaching this football team than any team in memory. It was fun. The 1998 season was a stormy one for the franchise. The Chiefs endured their first losing year under Marty Schottenheimer, who then made a stunning announcement that January. Today, the most winning coach in the AFC in the past 10 years is retiring. I have decided to step down as head coach of the Kansas City Chiefs and step away from coaching. After 10 years, I feel it is time to give someone else the opportunity to implement their plan. I just thought it was time. In our business, there's probably a shelf life for a head coach. <laughs> um, in my constant pursuit to find different ways to say the same thing, there reaches a point in time where it's very difficult to do that. Marty Ball is defined as running the football and playing stiff defense, and it proved to be a perfect match for the winter chill of Kansas City. There was no debating Schottenheimer's end results there, with over 100 wins to his credit. I know our time in Kansas City, we'd have some great regular seasons because he coached very well and, and did outcoach people. 13 and 3 or a 12 and 4 year and you lose in the playoffs to a team that eventually wins the Super Bowl, is that a sign of bad coaching in the playoffs or maybe that's just exceptional coaching in the regular season? People have always said, you know, Marty Ball is, is, is run the football, play good defense, but I think you look at Marty's teams and everywhere he's been is he's always tried to take what he's had and, and mold a team around him. And I think that uh, sometimes he's unfairly characterized with that. I think Marty, what he's done on a consistent basis over the time frame that he's done it is as good as any coach that's ever coached in the National Football League. Tragedy struck down one of Schottenheimer's finest in February of 2000. Derek Thomas died from a blood clot weeks after an auto accident left him paralyzed. I still recall it the day. It was a terrible day, kind of a, a rainy ice storm. The, the roads were slick. He was going to the airport. It was a tragic thing, you know, and it didn't need to be. That was a, the sad thing. He did not have his seatbelt fastened. Derek was uh, injured severely, but the guy in the back seat had a seatbelt on, and he walked away from it. I was playing golf in Naples, Florida, and um, I was coming down the 16th fairway. It was a par five. I saw this cart coming toward me with somebody from the shop, and that's in golf, you don't ever want to see them because something's wrong. He came up and he said, uh, Coach, you need to call your wife. She's fine, but she needs to talk to you. Derek was like one of our children. 
Sounds silly to say, but he was our draft choice. We saw Derek grow up. We saw Derek change. So I think he and Marty were very close. And um, it was very tragic what happened to Derek. And I think Marty will always be affected by that. It was a, a tragic loss, obviously, so young. A three-hour service in front of thousands at Kemper Arena marked the end of Kansas City's emotional goodbye to a fearsome linebacker and an adopted son. Derek Thomas was and always will be a shining light. And most of all for his family, that is how I know that he will always be remembered. Derek Thomas will always be a Kansas City Chief. The ninth head coach in Chiefs history was as big a name as any. Dick Vermeil offered the good cheer and winning credentials necessary to revive a flagging organization. There was only one person in my mind I would like to be the head coach of the Kansas City Chiefs. And I'm not concerned about my bias because I am biased. I think he is the premier head football coach in the National Football League, Dick Vermeil. I missed being with the coaching staff. I missed being a leader. I missed being with the players. Well, he was a player's type of coach. You know, when, when the head coach invites you home to dinner and he cooks a steak for you and his wife <laughs> serves you and he serves you some of the wine from his winery in California and he gets the group in, maybe the linebackers or wide receivers, and gets to know them personally, uh, that doesn't happen very often. The club reunited Vermeil with Trent Green that April. A welcome move for the quarterback who missed out on St. Louis's championship season. You know, and then I got hurt and, and wasn't sure if I'd get an opportunity to play again after that injury. And, and very thankful for Coach Vermeil uh, orchestrating the trade to get me here and give me an opportunity to play. And, and uh, once Coach gave me that announcement, and uh, uh, it, it was uh, very satisfying. One day after acquiring Green, the Chiefs continued to retool their offense by signing free agent Priest Holmes, a one-time 1,000-yard rusher in Baltimore. Well, you know, I'd like to say I knew Priest was going to be as good as he really is, but I didn't. He has a great sense of timing in, in utilization of his office, offensive blockers. He knows what they're doing, he, can, he reads what they're doing, and he'll run in rhythm of those guys. Holmes and his offensive line set the tone for a jaw-dropping 2003 season. Boy, they could attack you offensively. Um, they had a lot of weapons. Your quarterback, Trent Green, what, 4,000 yards, whatever he was throwing. Uh, Gonzalez was healthy, played extremely well. The wide receivers in those days finally got in the game and uh, came up with some outstanding catches. Everything seemed to click. Got to go out here and prove why I am the top. Be that X factor. Got to be the X factor. Kansas City dazzled on special teams as well. Dante Hall set an NFL record by scoring on returns in four straight games as the Chiefs started 9-0. He's in trouble, surrounded, now he gets to the left side. He's got nobody but the kicker in front of him. Hall's up the left side, 35-40. Dante Hall's gonna do it again. The human joystick with the touchdown, Kansas City, on an unbelievable kick return. Dante Hall, you know, was a guy that most people thought couldn't play in this league. But Dick Vermeule put his arms around him, gave him confidence, and taught him how to be a great player. That's the great talent of Dick Vermeil. He has a keen eye for talent. By week 17, the AFC West champs were 12 and three, and an opportunity arose for Holmes to break a league record of his own. Priest Holmes has now set an all-time record for total touchdowns in a single season. Priest Holmes picks up his 27th touchdown of the year. We know, we know the horse is going to get a game ball, okay? We know the horse is going to get it. We know the horse is going to get it. But if this win doesn't add to the quality of your Christmas, boys, don't stay in the National Football League. They don't come much better. I think right there, and all along even going into there, we're an extremely confident football team. Most people that 
played us didn't realize how fast we were. Hey, Dante Hall! What's hey, up, Hey, Dante Gross! Hey, this is my field. Hey, this is my we, field, we, baby. You know we're gonna Let's see do it. it. Let's oh, do it. Let's do it. The Chiefs ran stride for stride with Peyton Manning's Colts as the teams combined for over 800 yards of offense without a single punt. the best way to keep him on the sideline. You know that there are playmakers on each side of the ball. Which playmaker is going to get the job done? You don't really know. It's going to happen. It happens in, you know, in every football game. There's going to be just a couple of plays that make the difference between winning and losing. I think about that stuff all the time, like, man, you know, we got the playoffs coming up. I want to be that guy that made a big play. You know, the game is on the line that I can step up and, you know, help my teammates and make a big play. All right, Dante! Return ball! Now, Dante Hall wants to get it back in a hurry. He's going left side. Now he darts to the right side, explodes to the 40. He might do it. He's just got the kicker to beat. It's a foot race at the 25, 20, cuts back. 15, 10, Hall's touchdown! Kansas City! 93-yard kickoff return by the human joystick. Indianapolis ran down the clock late in the fourth quarter to keep Kansas City off the field, winning what was a spectacular effort from both sides. Improvement is all, always measured on the scoreboard in the National Football League. It's hard for a lot of people, management, ownership, players, to recognize the improvement. But if you're a football coach and a coaching staff, you can see individual and collective improvement. And you can see the value of the hard work it, it, you can see it, it's happening. One of those Chiefs who took a big step forward was running back Larry Johnson. In his first start of 2005, Johnson set up one of the toughest calls of Vermeil's coaching career. The Chiefs have to decide, kick an easy three to go to overtime or try to win the game on the snap. Let's go for the score right here, let's go for the score. Go that pass. Throw the one inch line. That decision, if we lose, could be the decision that uh, you live with the rest of your career. Man, is he going for it. Here we go, from the one-yard line. This is to win the game or lose the game. We as coaches finally got smart enough to find out what the hell you guys can do best. Run down their frickin' throat. You're gonna see more of it. You're gonna, I promise you, you're gonna see more of it. Johnson rewarded Vermeil's leap of faith with a run for the ages. In week 17, he broke the Chiefs' single season rushing record, sending his coach into retirement in grand style. It's a block, two now inside the 10. Nice going, kiddo. Great going. 201 yards. Just the beginning. <laughs> Just the beginning. Huh? A Pittsburgh victory kept Kansas City from reaching the playoffs. So Vermeil said his goodbyes. Few coaches were as respected. None were so beloved. Great going, buddy. Just great. Yeah. You're the best. And you will always be the best. Make it better next year. Huh? Make it better. You're special. I'll be there when they put you in the hall. Okay? Thanks Thank a lot, you, man. buddy. Oh, love, love you, man. You. Love you too. Oh! 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 We had to get you one leg. It's most appropriate that the last two game balls goes to the best, the number one football family. There's not a better coach, not a better person, not a better wife, St. Carol, not a better family. On behalf of the Kansas City Chiefs, thank you for being with us and thank making you. it so thank special. You, thank you. You are the best. Thank you. Thank you, guys.
10 head coaches have led the Chiefs into battle. Hank Stram was the first and, by far, the most successful. After 15 seasons, Stram was fired and replaced by Paul Wiggin, who had neither the success, the wardrobe, nor the style of his predecessor. One of the two remaining crew cuts in the National Football League, Paul Wiggin down there. Seven games into his third season, Wiggin was gone, replaced by Tom Bettis. In 1978, Marv Levy came out of the Canadian Football League and spent five years as Kansas City's chief chief. John Makovic, an offensive guru from Tom Landry's staff, next took over, lasting four seasons, then replaced by his assistant head coach, Frank Gans. Gans coached the Chiefs for just two seasons before Kansas City hired Marty Schottenheimer, their first head coach with previous NFL head coaching experience. In 1999, Gunther Cunningham, defensive coordinator under Schottenheimer, began a two-year stint, followed by Dick Vermeil's five-year tenure when he became the third Chiefs head coach to compile a winning record. Vermeil's successor was well known in the organization. Herm Edwards spent six years as a scout and assistant for Kansas City in the early 1990s. And like Vermeil before him, paid meticulous attention to detail and had an infectious competitive spirit. Well, I can't say enough about both individuals, uh, Dick Vermeil, Herman Edwards. They're the highest quality individuals uh, you could ever want, and, and we've been fortunate to have them both as the head coach of the Kansas City Chiefs. They are very different individuals in a lot of ways and very similar in other ways. Um, you know, Herman uh, likes young players, whereas Dick probably uh, preferred a more mature team. With Lamar Hunt in attendance for the season opener, Edwards lost a key veteran for weeks when Trent Green suffered a concussion. Trent Green in trouble, gets away. Scrambling, he's gonna run right 50, he's gonna go down! Foot first at the 45 and Green is injured. Trent Green is down. He looks like he's out. He looks like he may have taken a knockout punch. The thing you learn right away is you can't panic. And I think if you show any sign of panic with your football team, uh, because everyone's saying at that point, when your starting quarterback goes down opening day, Good things generally don't happen when that happens to you, but you got to find, find a way to uh, fight through it. Fortunately, backup Damon Heward became a concrete fill-in for Green, and Johnson's grinded-out game crushed opponents into powder. Just be brave. Don't, don't, don't leave. You'll be okay. It's okay. You're going to be fine. fine. We're going to bring it downhill. We're going to bring it downhill. Stay right with me. I'm going to help you. I'm going to help you. I said, Johnson, powering into the end zone, touchdown, Kansas City. Hey, uh, it's okay, baby. I ain't gonna give up on you. Never, no, I, I love you, man. I ain't giving up on you. I get my smile now. There you go. The Chiefs eyeballed a playoff berth while fighting back tears. Hunt's passing in mid-December left the franchise grief-stricken. He was remembered as a football visionary and a father figure to all who worked for him. A member of the Pro Football Hall of Fame, Hunt championed social change in a sport he left stronger than he found it. He was known for his humility and integrity. And uh, I think uh, looking at our coaching staffs over the years and also at, at many of the players who played for us, um, those qualities rubbed off on them. There's a saying in, in, in in the Bible, uh, you know, uh, humility before honor. Uh, he was very humble. For him to give opportunities to, 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 to the black players early when other teams would, would just shy away, Lamar went straight ahead and did it. From a minority standpoint, the greatest concern was, is it going to be fair? Is it going to be decent and reasonable and equal? So you're observing everything that you're around. 
If you observe Lamar, you observe someone who treated people fairly. Everybody. I don't think he ever realized, and I even told him this, the number of lives he has touched in a very positive way. When you take a look at all of the players who played in the American Football League, and not just for Kansas City, but for all of the players in the American Football League and the American Football Conference, Lamar Hunt was a guy they should thank for fulfilling his dream, because when he fulfilled his dream, he helped us fulfill ours. So today we salute a man who can neither kick, nor pass, nor block, nor punt. But I humbly submit that the man who is being honored here today served more than any one individual in our time to rewrite the pages of sports history. Our guiding light, our pleasant leader, the implausible Texan, Lamar Hunt. When I first took the job, I can remember him saying, it's always nice to say that when, you, when the season's over with and you come to the owners' meetings and, and you all sit down and you, you converse it, that you're a playoff team. And that was important. The playoffs were big to Lamar and, and obviously winning playoff games and winning a championship. But, it, but he always wanted that recognition. I can always remember that he was very, very proud when your team got in the playoffs. Kansas City honored Hunt with a heartfelt victory in the final week qualifying for postseason play with a panache that could carry on for years to come. It's a flea flicker. The Chiefs are going to run a flea flicker deep for Kennison. Deep corner pattern for the end zone. Touchdown! Happy New Year, Jaguars! All the ups and downs that that football team went through last year with the coach and staff, you're talking about a new staff, quarterback goes, gets hurt, and then Lamar's death, and team handled it very, very well, and for us to get in, I think, uh, obviously, was a tribute to Lamar. I frankly think the job he did last year was tremendous in getting us to the playoffs in what had to be termed a, a transition year, and, uh, you know, two or three years down the road, I think he's going to have the kind of group together that he feels is capable of contesting for a Super Bowl. No one says you got to lose. There ain't no rule that says you got to lose, man. You just play them one at a time. That's the maturity we're getting at, man, as a good football team. We'll get better. We'll get better. It's always, always good to get better when you win, man. Stay humble. All right, let's get in here one time for the Chiefs, man. Right. Bring up the cup. All right. Chiefs on three. One, two, three. Chiefs. This NFL Films production has been brought to you by NFL Network. Watch the National Football.